Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Say with me, thanks be to God. Friends, will you pray with me before we, read this, um, before we reflect on the scriptures together this morning? Gracious and holy God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this time and this space and this beautiful weather and this community gathered near and far to worship you, to remember your grace, even in the harshest wilderness. May we know the comfort of your angels as they minister to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So after 40 days in the wilderness, after a long time of hunger and longing and dissatisfaction, after multiple temptations to despair, and fear and compromise after hunger and desire and doubt. Suddenly angels came and waited on Jesus. Uh, we don't talk much about angels, do we? Uh, I have a degree that labels me a master of divinity, which um, for the record is an inaccurate title. <laughs> um, but to receive that degree, I had to have uh, all kinds of engagement with complex arguments regarding, you know, the persons of the Trinity, the two natures and wills of Christ, the in inspiration of Holy Scripture, the relationships between nature and grace and the church and the state, the kinds of things that uh, we talk about in theology class on Sunday nights. But no one made me read anything about angels. Uh, for many of us, the very concept of angels feels just like magical. It's just mythological or childish. We live in a world that privileges sight. The eyes are the organ of knowledge. If we want to know something, we believe that we have to see it. Uh, and yet the angels and the teachings of the church don't have physical bodies, uh, and so they are beyond sight. Whatever reality they signify or occupy, uh, we can't see it. And so even in the Bible, when someone receives a spiritual vision of an angel, the descriptions are so weird. Um, it's pretty clear they're not sure what they've just seen, right? Like angels are described as like fiery serpents and monsters covered with eyes. Um, human language fails when it comes up against these spiritual beings. When an angel appears, it's normally its voice that the scriptures want to tell us about because angels bring messages from God. Uh, but, but we don't trust voices that can't show the proof of what they're talking about. We know something is true when we can see it, analyze it, and examine it, when we can derive a practical outcome from it. Um, and so uh, 
angels become kind of quaint and outdated. Like, who cares how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? But angels are everywhere in Scripture. These spiritual beings beyond what we can see who encourage and bring good news. They're surrounding the throne of God with songs of praise. They guard Eden with a flaming sword. And of course, the devil who tempts Jesus in the wilderness is a fallen angel. We trust our eyes, but in the imagination of scripture, there are unseen forces at work in the world. Some working for dominion and power, whispering accusation and despair into our ears so that we will be docile to their instructions, while others, and there are others, come like a light in the darkness and encourage us, do not be afraid. In our reading this morning, angels come to Jesus in the wilderness at this crucial moment after the devil leaves him. After 40 days of the devil's spectacles, whispering, Images of stone turned to bread, dazzling us with the sight of all the kingdoms of the world in a single moment, taking our breath as we teeter on the pinnacle of the temple. After this flurry of desires that flash before our eyes, there is a moment. There's a moment between us. So Jesus has withstood the temptation, and he's about to step onto the road that leads directly to the cross, but there is this pause in between. And for some reason, this pause between the temptation and the task, this pause is when Jesus really needs the angels to come to him. I wonder if that's because sometimes the pauses in between are when we need comfort the most. Or maybe when we are tempted the most in quieter ways than we were before. I'm talking about the pause after the shock has faded away, but before some new version of quote unquote normal establishes itself. The pause after the adrenaline wears off, when the pain it was masking really begins to make itself known. Not the minute after a great tragedy, not that moment when you find yourself inundated with adrenaline and casseroles, but six weeks later, when the pain is morphing and shifting into new forms, rather than giving way to peace. Sometimes those moments are the hardest ones of all. In the intensity of the moment, you didn't have the time to wonder what if. All you could do was slam the brakes and turn the wheel, sprint to your beloved side, and cry. In the trying moment, there's no space to breathe. Act and survive. It's only later in the stillness, the pause that you hoped would be peaceful, that all of a sudden the moment, the trauma, the oppression takes on an afterlife and begins, begins to give shape to a future. It's in that stillness, that pause, that you realize the moment was not just a moment, but is now part of the story that is you. In the pause after some trauma, a series of questions to yourself. It lives on in your body so that you can feel what should have been an anniversary in your shoulders and a constriction in your chest before you even remember it. Sometimes the pauses in between are as hard as what happened. We need someone to come to us in those moments to tell us, don't be afraid. Life's catastrophes are not self-contained, but spread tentacles into the past and the future. The past so that even good memories become tinged with sadness, and into the future so that you know you will never be normal in the same way again. The theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer says that in fact, our whole lives are such an in-between moment that we find ourselves caught in the middle, cut off from the beginning in Eden, the days before sin, and not yet able or ready for our end in paradise. Taking our flesh, who is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, has come to meet us in the middle. In the wilderness, he has withstood the temptations, 
But where does that leave him? Jesus doesn't turn the stones to bread, but that means he's still hungry. He's refused to take control of all the kingdoms of the earth, but that means the devil still manages the world. And again, amen. <laughs> Jesus has refused the leap from the temple, but the cross is still before him. Jesus has resisted the devil, but we still desire what the devil offers. What if everyone in the world had enough bread? What if those with the ability to do so made decisions that were honest and just? That's maybe the greatest temptation of all to think they were ever would. <laughs> what if we had tangible proof, like a voice from heaven, every time we had questions for God? There's a reason we want those things. This is what we think things were like in the beginning, when the earth produced food without toil. When Adam and Eve lived in harmony with one another and walked with God as with a friend, this is what things will be like in the end. When every tear is wiped away, when every tribe, tongue, and nation will enjoy together the heavenly banquet in God's own presence. We still long for these things, and in themselves, they're good things. The devil can't create new things. Only God can. And so the devil is left to manipulate and twist God's goods offering us a version of our own innocent beginning and the end we hope for. Jesus has rejected all of the devil's temptations, but we're left wondering, like, what, like, what now? People are still hungry. Power still corrupts. Faith is so frail. The devil at least offered a, a plan, you know? It was like a practical and efficient way of achieving manageable goals. You know, it was damnation, but, you know, it got you somewhere. So long as Jesus was willing to compromise. If you want to feed the hungry, feed yourself first. Get your own. If you want the nations to know your name, you have to participate in the process. If you want to know that God loves you, take a step to make God prove it. Everything you want can be arranged. In all of the temptations in the wilderness, the devil offered a shortcut that Jesus could use to get himself and the rest of us out of the middle. But we can't get ourselves out of the middle. And neither could Jesus, even if he had given in to the devil's temptations. The devil cannot free us. The devil, with all his temptations, cannot restore God's likeness in us. The devil cannot bring us to our promised end at the heavenly banquet table. It was the devil's lie that we could be like God that got us stuck in the middle in the first place. And our continued attempts to be like God, to save ourselves, to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, to prove that we are good, only ensnare us all the more in the trap the devil set for us. This is why when we were expelled from the Garden of Eden, God placed an angel with a flaming sword at the gate. God knew we would try to go back by our own means that we would try to conquer and colonize the garden, and that in so doing, we would only get ourselves even more stuck in the same patterns. So in the beginning, God has an angel watch the garden and us to keep us on the way forward. This is what angels do. They come to our aid in the middle, help us to travel the hard road through the valley of the shadow of death. Sometimes when we need it or when we are thinking of trying our own way out, they wrestle with us like Jacob. When we're alone and short on hope, they might come to us. Moment Elijah discovered that all alone, there were in fact 7,000 others in Jerusalem trying to help. They come to encourage in the midst of grief and hopelessness, like the angel who met the woman at the tomb after the crucifixion and told them, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. In the middle of our lives, which are fraught with catastrophe and the scars of catastrophe, it often seems we have every reason to be afraid. We see hunger and warfare and poverty and racism and the overwhelming power of the ruling cross. 
the same old stories people have been talking about for decades or centuries. And our eyes leave us wondering if there are any other possibilities for the world. Our eyes tell us that a deal with the devil might be the only way to move forward. But in the middle, the angels in scripture teach us that there are senses other than our eyes. Faith, after all, is the assurance of things hoped for, the confidence in things unseen. The angels tell us that what we cannot see, sometimes we have to sing for ourselves and to each other. Above all else, the angels are the heavenly choir that sings holy, 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 reminding us that God is greater than whatever opposes us, greater than whatever we could possibly ask for or imagine or see with our own eyes. Our eyes need light to work properly, but sound resonates in the universe. The angels, holy, 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 sings hope in God when our eyes can't see it. It's no coincidence that so much great music emerges out of tremendous suffering. The angels come to Jesus in the wilderness just as he's about to embark on the path to the cross. And there between the Jordan and Golgotha and the empty tomb, they minister to him. They gather around him in the darkness just as they gather around the heavenly throne where they sing holy, 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 heaven and earth are full of your glory even now. My friends, there is great evil at work in the world. The powers and the principalities still belong to the devil. And they manipulate a world of which many do not have enough world. And they use a false gospel to justify this world that they've made. But when we talk about the angels, we remind ourselves that there are other powers at work within creation that move us to clothe the stranger, feed the hungry, visit the pris prisoner, sing together, joining the heavenly choirs, only to find that even when we couldn't see it, we were hosting angels unaware. Amen. <laughs>